Heritage Bible Church would like to welcome us and ask us a question. How many of us know how really loved we are? Do we know the extent of God's love? And do we know the extent of the love that we have here at Sagewood for each other? This picture on the screen which Pastor Paul always uses to explain us, is perfect. Notice we are holding hands while we're crossing the bridge together from Sagewood to God's loving arms. We don't know when we're going home, but we do know we will continue to have an eternal connection with our Lord and each other. Let us paint a picture of our life together with the help of R.W. Emerson. To laugh often and much. To win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children. To earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends. To appreciate beauty to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by healthy children, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because we have lived. This is to have succeeded. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for your love. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for giving us each other. May we live the blessed life you have given us to your glory alone. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in our first hymn on this communion Sunday, Lead Me to Calvary.
real pleasure to come and, and read this particular scripture because, is that better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be here to read this particular scripture because the first couple of verses really give us a message. If ever we feel sorry for ourselves and what happened in our life, all we have to do is read these verses and we should feel better about our situation. So, I guess we ha do we have it up on the screen? Yes. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law <coughs> of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Those who live, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is dead, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who, are in, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life <coughs> to your mortal bodies because of, the, of his spirit who lives in you. <coughs> May God bless this reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Great to have each and every one of you here today. Your smiling faces. Happy Super Bowl Day, right? <laughs> I wasn't planning on this, but I, I thought in light of events in our culture, I wanted to remind each and every one of us, when you read the book of Daniel, Romans 13, and 1 Peter 2, and even in the trial of our Lord Jesus, where he was condemned to death, Jesus told Pilate that he could do nothing unless the power was given to him. World leaders are there by God's divine appointment. And in the turmoil that our country is facing, it is critical that we as believers Keep even keeled that God is sovereign and God raises up leaders and God removes leaders. And our job is to submit to that wonderful sovereignty of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Beloved, he is on the throne, and he is in control. Nothing is surprising him. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that you are the sovereign Lord over heaven and earth. That nothing escapes your control. That you're never surprised by the acts of humans. Lord, you know the end from the beginning. And therefore, everything you plan will be fulfilled. And that includes world leaders. Even the police officer that patrols our streets. They are there by divine appointment. And so you've told us in 1 Timothy that we are to pray for these leaders so that the gospel of Jesus Christ would have freedom to expand. And that's what we pray for today. That through the leaders that you have over us, whether it's locally here in Scottsdale and Phoenix, the state of Arizona, our federal government, Lord, you are in control, and we pray for those leaders that they would bow their knee before you, the sovereign Lord, and that they would be getting their direction and wisdom, not from the latest polls, but from the Lord Jesus Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. And we worship you today, Lord. It's important for us to remember this. It's easy to get off keel when we watch the news. When we listen to talking heads who are spouting opinions. And the unbecoming behavior of others. Keep us even keeled by your sovereignty, Lord. And so we pray as Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Did I miss my... No. We are doing an offering in doxology. I did not read the bulletin carefully. I created it, and I forgot to read it. So we're glad that you guys are on step here. Thank you, Phyllis, and everybody.
stay here. Um, please join me in our next hymn, uh, Jesus Paid It All. and thank you for doing that. As we prepare our hearts for communion, um, I just want us to reflect upon the fact that Jesus did pay it all. Between the reading that Norm and the wonderful welcome that Jill gave us today, I hope you realize that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus.
can never hear it enough. When Christ died on the cross, he took your penalty for sin, my penalty for sin, which was death, eternal separation from a loving, holy God who demands perfection and will not compromise that. And the perfect Son of God took on all of our sin on that cross. And therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I want you to put your name. There is therefore now no condemnation for Bob for Joan, and Jill, and Norm, and Sai, and Dottie, <coughs> and Margaret, and Jeannie. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As we partake today, keep telling yourself that. <coughs> Well, it's Super Bowl Sunday, isn't it? And I'm rooting for my favorite team, the Cleveland Browns. I'm still praying they'll win the Super Bowl sometime, at least in my lifetime. At least in my lifetime. Maybe they'll win a Super Bowl. But I can keep wishing. Bud Wilkinson, the former coach of the Oklahoma Center some time ago, this, I define football as 22 men on the field who desperately need rest, being watched by 50,000 people in the stands who desperately need exercise. <laughs> what is it about the Super Bowl that attracts so many people, so diverse, from across the globe? That, that descend upon a city and spend all kinds of money. I heard the average ticket is over $5,800. <laughs> I heard Jerry Jones, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, is showing up in his $200 million yacht. Did you hear about this thing? $200 million yacht. And it doesn't just have one, but two heliports, one at each one. And you could get lost on that thing. The amount of wealth and money that's being spent this weekend is astronomical. I heard at one statistic probably about 10, 15 years ago that on Super Bowl Sunday, over 10 tons of popcorn are consumed. <laughs> I'm having chili dogs this afternoon and I can't wait. But that's just me. But this whole idea of the Super Bowl led me to think about today's subject. There we go. Today's, the whole idea of Super Bowl got me to think about this one very question. We go to the Super Bowl, we watch the Super Bowl because we love champions. And it's our goal that the team that we're rooting for would win so we could say, we're champions. Right, Neil? Even though you're rooting for this. 49ers, that's okay. We'll, we'll pray for you. 
<laughs> but it led me to think of this question. How do I become a champion for Christ? What does that look like? Does God want me to be a champion? Well, as we'll find out later, that God has made us overwhelmingly conquerors in Christ Jesus. So, of course, he wants us to be champions. Sin has a way of throwing us down with guilt and condemnation. That's why we spend some time during communion that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And it's important for us to understand what this series that we're starting is all about. Champions for Christ for the next three weeks. And what that looks like. Because, quite frankly, I don't want to go through life being a loser, do you? Of course not. We want to have victory in our life. But here's the catch. I have this thing inside of me called the flesh that gets tired and hungry, and those are not good combinations. Ask my wife, when the bear's tired and hungry, the bear gets grumpy. And it's never good. But I also get grumpy about other things. Traffic, and, and I know that comes from the flesh. When I want to reach out and touch somebody and ask them to get out of the way and not drive 55 miles an hour in the left-hand lane. For the love of God, move over. <laughs> I know what my flesh is capable of doing. And it's not pretty. And God knew that my flesh was more powerful than anything that I could muster up, whether physical strength, mental strength, internal strength, to overcome the flesh. And so we needed someone in our life to overcome that principle of sin, where sin can enter into our lives called our flesh. So Paul starts out today by showing us how do we become a champion for Christ? We need to let the Holy Spirit be our coach. You say, well, good night. Where do I get that? Well, our text is from Galatians 5. Norm brought the backdrop because Romans 8 and Galatians 5 go hand in hand. They are, they are twin sisters. When you start reading Romans 8 and you come over to Galatians 5, you see things be very parallel. That's why if you have a center, uh, center reference column in your Bible or cross-references, it's always good to chase those bunnies because you start seeing how the Bible is, is united. And this passage highlights that passage. And when you start studying the Word of God that way, you, your mind begins to open of how God creates themes throughout His Word. And this is just one of them. Paul was a huge sports fan. Throughout his writings he, he wrote about track and field he wrote about wrestling he even wrote about the gladiators and mentions those and while the super bowl wasn't around in the first century when he wrote i would imagine that if paul was writing to churches today he would use analogies from football because that's just the kind of guy he was in the fifth chapter of galatians we already know from previous messages in January that the theme of Galatians 5 is love. Love for one another so we can serve one another. The other thing that happens in Galatians 5 is Paul switches from talking about a lot of theology and proving his case that we're justified by faith to now how do we walk out, how do we walk in that faith, day-to-day -day living? How does it practically work out? But with the errors that were in the Galatian church, many of the Christians believed that they still needed to work out their faith by works of the law. Yes, I accepted Christ by faith, but now I really have to put on energy because God expects this from me. And if I do X, Y, and Z, then God's going to be happy with me. 
So Paul spends a great deal of time in Galatians 5 and 6 to rebuke that, to correct that teaching. And herein lies the importance of today's message and the next two weeks. If we remain in that type of thinking, thinking that I have to perform for God, we will always struggle in our walk. We will always feel like we've never done enough. And then our flesh and the enemy of our soul will do nothing but beat us over the head with a proverbial guilt and condemnation. That's not where God wants us to live. God wants us to live as victors, as champions for Jesus Christ. So Paul says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. That kind of resembles what Norm just read today, what doesn't it? If you walk according to the flesh, you're in rebellion against God. For these are in opposition to one another, Paul continues, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. It still begs the question, how do I become a champion? Paul tells us to become a champion, I need to let the Spirit of God be my coach. You say, well, where did I get that? First of all, we need to stop and ask ourselves a question, uh, ask, answer a couple questions. Number one, who is the Spirit? And what is the flesh? Let's start with the Spirit. The Spirit of God is the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is the third person of Godhead. Sometimes you'll see symbols like this, representing the Trinity, showing that they're three different persons, but they're co-equal, and they make up the Godhead. Then you'll see symbols like this, where it'll show the Father is not the Son, but the Father is God. And the Son's not the Father, and the Son's not the Spirit, but the Son is God. And the Spirit is, not, is neither the Son nor the Father, but He is God. I like this symbol because it really explains the Trinity. And there's all kinds of analogies that people use. You know, water, is, water can be in three forms, right? It can be in the form of a gas when it's boiled, it steams. It can be ice, and it can be a liquid. And they explain the Trinity that way. Now, that's limited, but it works when you're trying to talk to kids. And then other people use an egg, the shell, the white part, and the yolk. But that has its extreme limitations. We're not here to try to describe it because, quite frankly, God is infinite and I'm finite. And when you pour the infinite into this mind, there's always spillage. I don't understand God fully. And if God were not a mystery in some ways, and I could fully figure him out, what kind of God would that be? Not the kind of God I want to worship. I do understand a lot about God, but there's a lot I don't understand. The other thing we need to talk about is the Spirit of God is not an it or a thing, and he's not a force. You know, like, may the force be with you kind of a thing. There's a lot of misunderstanding and, and, and bad teaching that describes the Spirit of God as, as an it or a thing or a force. You get this in a lot of New Age teaching. And they try to manipulate Scripture to show that everyone has a, has a spirit within them. And depending on who you feed, the, the, the good spirit or the bad spirit, that will be your character. Well, that's a whole other discussion, but what they're teaching is false. The Spirit of God is co-equal with the Father and the Son. He is not in it. He is a, he's not a force. He's a person. I'll show you in just a minute from Scripture how I prove that. The other thing that we need to understand is the Spirit of God is not the third edition of God. There is a thing called modalism. It started in the late first century, early second, probably late first century. And modal was a guy who said that God the Father existed in the Old Testament. He's the mean old grumpy God that killed everybody. And then during the New Testament time, Jesus came along. He was the second edition of God. And then now, the church age, 
That's the addition of the Holy Spirit. That's called modalism. And it's completely unbiblical. Because when you open up Genesis chapter 1, you see the Trinity in action. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. And the Spirit of God hovered <coughs> over the darkness. And God spoke and said, let there be light. And God spoke is the Word. And we know from John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's Jesus Christ. So from Genesis 1, we have the Trinity on display. So modalism is a really bad heresy. So who is the Spirit of God? Well, He is God. According to Acts chapter 5, Peter says to Ananias and Sapphira when they lied, they said, you haven't lied to me. You've lied to God. Why did you put the Spirit of God to the test and lie to Him? In Genesis 1-2, we've already mentioned it, that the Spirit of God was moving. So the Holy Spirit is God. He's also a person. Jesus prayed in the upper room discourse. He says, I'm going to pray to the Father, and I'm going to send you another helper. And that word another means one just like me. In character, in deity, he's just like me, but he's called the Spirit. And well, he will lead you into all the truth. He's another helper. In Ephesians 4.30, we're told, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. You can't grieve a force. You can't grieve an it. I can't walk up to my wife's candle on the table and make it grieve. Or a plant. It's an it. Only people can grieve. So we see that the Holy Spirit is God, and He is a person. Now that we've identified the Holy Spirit, let's look at the flesh. What happens is, uh, to us at the moment of being born again, and we'll get into this when we get into Romans 6 in two weeks, God willing, is we had a sin nature that we were born with. And that sin nature, when we accepted Christ, vicariously was nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ and it was put to death. God gave us a new nature. His nature that lives within us. And that's why the Holy Spirit came to give us that new nature. 2 Peter chapter 1 talks more about that if you want to study it. But there's one thing in us that still hasn't been redeemed. And that's our flesh. Not, not the flesh and bone, but this principle within us that gets tired, fatigued, ill, that makes us feel like, I don't want to do that because I just want to sit here and relax when we know we should get off the couch and do the right thing. It is through that principle called the flesh that is the vehicle wherein sin can enter into our lives. Again, we'll get into this more when we get into Romans 6. But suffice to say, this, we've identified who the Spirit of God is. The flesh is this thing within us that still allows, it keeps the back door open in our lives for sin to enter. For me to act like the grumpy bear when I get tired and hungry. Paul says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires. See, when we become, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to become a champion for Christ, we have to invite the Holy Spirit to be our coach. And the first step of Him being our coach is we've got to let Him call the place. You say, well, where did you get that? Well, the Spirit of God is also called the teacher in John chapter 16. And 1 John 2. He's called a teacher. And all good coaches teach, don't they? They're teaching their players how to run the play. How to make sure you don't step this way, you turn around this way and hand off the ball. There's all kinds of teaching going on as a coach. And the Spirit of God calls the plays. 
What's this playbook? It's right here. Here's this playbook. It is our job to study the playbook. So when he calls the plays, we're on the same page. And when we do that, it is the first step in becoming a champion for Christ. The word walk is not... It means my manner of life, my lifestyle, who I am, even when no one's watching. The old King James used to say conversation. I say to you, let your conversation be with the Spirit. It is our, my lifestyle. It is who I am. And when we study the, patent, the, the, the scriptures, we're studying the coach's system. And every coach has a system. Head coach for the 49ers, Shanahan, he's got a beautiful system. And so does Andy Reid. Andy Reid is an offensive genius when it comes to NFL football. He'll pull a play out, and he'll create one on the fly on the sidelines. That's how good he is. And he's always got his feather in his cap to pull into the game and let you see a play you've never seen before. The Holy Spirit's got a game plan. And he's got plays that he wants to call to help you overcome the flesh so that you don't fall victim to sin. This is critical for us. Paul says when you walk this way by the Spirit, guess what? Guess what the benefit is? You won't carry out the desire of the flesh. The flesh has its own will. And as Norm read today, what is that flesh's will? To go against everything that God stands for. The flesh is at enmity with God. It doesn't subject itself. In fact, it's a flat-out rebel against the hand of God. It wants its way all the time. Especially when you're on a diet and you open up the refrigerator and you see those two chocolate eclairs sitting right there. The flesh takes over right there. I mean, it's just going crazy, right? But Paul says if you play by his playbook, if you join his system, if you walk in that system, you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. Well, how do I know when I'm walking with the Spirit or walking according to the flesh. Look at verse 17. Paul says, The flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. As I mentioned, the flesh wants to resist the leadership and coaching from the Holy Spirit. And when we abide by what the flesh wants, all of a sudden there's a major conflict. What's the conflict? The spirit goes against the flesh because the spirit's trying to go, hey, pay attention to the handbook here. This is where you want to go. And the flesh is going, don't listen to that person. This is where I want you to go. And, it, and it's putting a temptation that's in front of you that you know you enjoy, but you know that every time you get there, the results are terrible. But it looks so good. And the spirit of God is saying, no, pay attention to me. Because when we start paying attention to the flesh instead of the spirit, what happens? We become double-minded. How do I know that? Look what Paul says. Paul says right here, these are in opposition to a life so that you may not do the things that you please. You ever experienced double-mindedness? Where you're so confused about the situation, you don't know heads from tails. And you don't know which way to turn. That's this battle going on. Just as an aside, if you don't have this struggle going on in your life, if there's no struggle like this going on, I'm going to encourage you, maybe you don't have the Spirit of God in you. I'm not here pointing a finger. I said maybe. And maybe in order to get the Spirit of God, you need to have a new relationship with Jesus Christ and become born again. When we become born again, he sends his spirit of God to us. And then that battle begins. But we have an undefeated coach. He's never lost a game. Isn't that great? The Holy Spirit has never lost a game. He always wins when we submit to him. 
Not only must we allow him to call the plays, but we also need to let him run the place. You say, wait a minute, coaches don't run the place. Well, this coach does. Look at verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, that word led is a very interesting word. It means that we submit to his leadership as a coach. And we allow him not only to call the place, but run the place. And we follow along with him. We know what the play is going to be. But sometimes we need to ask him, how does the playbook apply to this situation that I'm facing right now, Lord? And the Spirit of God is going to answer that prayer. Say, okay, God, by faith, I believe that this is where you want me to go. I'm trusting you. Let's run the play. And leave the consequences to God. So just because we follow the Holy Spirit doesn't mean the consequences are always going to be good. Your neighbor may not understand when you share Christ with them. Your children or grandchildren may be sick and tired of you talking about your relationship with the Lord, but keep talking to them. They're listening. This is not a let go and let God thing. Let me see if I can use an illustration. Whichever team is on offense, there's a quarterback on the field, right? And that quarterback is the field general. Coach calls into play, the quarterback runs the play, right? Without the quarterback, the play doesn't get off. The Spirit of God is not only the coach, he's the quarterback. And when the quarterback says hike, he expects me to know the play and be in the right position at the right time so he can use me in the ministry that God has called us to. And that's when we experience something, folks, that is phenomenal. Because the Spirit of God fills you with His presence and, and gives you a joy and a delight. Why? Because you're gaining victory. You just gained victory over the flesh. And you feel that. And you experience it. And you go, this is fantastic. I've struggled with this sin for most of my life. And now I've submitted to the Spirit of God. He's my coach. And I'm letting him call the place. I'm letting him run the place. I'm just following him. And boom! He's allowed me to have a victory. See, when we let the Spirit of God coach our lives, we become champions for Jesus Christ. Andy Reid was born March 19, 1958. He's a head football coach of the Kansas City Chiefs. You know that. He was previously the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles, where he had a really good career, a position he held from 1999 to 2012. He led the Eagles to five NFC Conference Championship games, including four consecutive appearances from 2001 to 2004, and one Super Bowl appearance in 2005, which he lost by a narrow margin. Today, he's leading the Chiefs in Super Bowl 54. Reed ranks sixth in all-time NFL head coaching wins at 221, which are the most of any NFL coach without a Super Bowl championship. He's married and has five children. He also belongs to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Kyle Michael Shanahan, the son of the former NFL coach Mike Shanahan, was born December 14, 1979. A coach in the NFL born in 1979. Boy, does that make me feel old right there. <laughs> He's the head coach of the Niners. He previously served as offensive coordinator on several teams, including the Atlanta Falcons, when they led the league in 2016 with the most points scored. And he helped, to reach, he helped the team reach Super Bowl 51. In addition, he was the offensive coordinator for the Texans, the Redskins, and my favorite team, the Cleveland Browns. Why we got rid of them? Someone has some questions to answer for me. On February 6, 2017, he was ushered in as the new coach of the 49ers. And now he's leading his team against Andy Reid. He's the son of former head coach Mike Shanahan. He's also married and has one daughter. While these coaches 
are leading their teams into the NFL Super Bowl, the greatest game of all time if you're a football player or a football fan. Both of these men would admit, I didn't get there without having coaches around me in my life who were greater, smarter, and knew the game far better than I did. And to this day, they still have men and women around them who support their system. Beloved, we have the greatest coach in the universe. And all too often, I think, sometimes as Christians, we neglect to let that coach call the plays and run the plays of our lives. And we try to overcome the flesh in our own strength. The Spirit of God will not only coach us and teach us, He's going to be there to encourage us when we fail. He's not going to condemn us. He's going to say, let's get back up. Let's study the playbook a little bit more, and we'll be ready next time. And when we allow Him to coach us, we will begin to experience victory after victory after victory over the flesh. As I mentioned earlier, we have a coach who's undefeated. He's never lost a battle yet. And when we do that, we will become champions for Christ by allowing the Holy Spirit to coach our lives. You say, well, Paul, is, are there signs, are there marks when we know we're walking in the flesh or when we're walking in the spirit. Are there markers for that? Well, yes, there are. But you'll have to wait until next week. <laughs> and until then, walk in him. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful that you have given us the greatest coach in the world to gain victory in our lives over the flesh. He is the Holy Spirit. He's also called the Spirit of Jesus, or the Spirit of God. He's the comforter. He's our teacher. He's the one that comes alongside of us and teaches us and encourages us to walk in Him. So we pray, Lord, that today we've talked about some things that might be new to a lot of people. But I pray that they would invite you to be their coach. Because as we follow Jesus, there's nothing greater in this world to be on a championship team. And we can all be champions for you, Jesus, when we allow the Spirit of God to be our coach. Amen? Amen. 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 Please join me in our closing hymn, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. to shine upon you. Lift up your countenance and be gracious to you and give you peace. God bless you. There's no condemnation 
to those in Christ. And listen to the coach. There is a family congregational meeting immediately following this service. Sorry for not to announce that, but there's been the bulletin for two weeks. We've announced it, and it will be immediately uh, following non-members uh, grab a cookie, and um, that'll start as soon as Helen calls it to order. Helen, why don't you sit down for a moment, and we'll, we'll get that this all set up. Uh, beginning of time. This would be March uh, 2018. 